If only they knew the hub for young business minds. Yes, people, it's Ted Lawler, a.k.a. Mr. IOTK from If Only They Knew, the UK's number one podcast for young business minds. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at IOTK Podcast to stay in the loop. Today, we have UFC bantamweight fighter Nathaniel Wood, who speaks about how he went from a young labourer to a world champion and shares his advice on how to be successful. If you're looking to adopt a champion mindset, this is the podcast for you. Hello, guys. I'm Nathaniel Wood. I'm a current UFC bantamweight fighter and I'm the former Cage Warriors world champion at bantamweight. And I'm happy to be here. Lovely. And you're, you're a proper, proper fighter. And like I said before, before we start recording, you're, you're a humble guy. Um, I'm sure the people listening would have, would have heard of you. If not, I think it'd be great for them to sort of dive deeper into your story. Um, but I always say to understand who someone is now, it's good to rewind the clocks a bit and sort of understand who they was when they was a little bit younger. Um, so for you, what was you like when you were younger? Was, was you sort of the stereotypical, <clears throat> much like myself, in order to be sort of really independent at an older age, you, you almost had to be naughty and sort of rebellious at a younger age. Was you, was you mm-hmm. quite naughty at school? Or? Um, I wasn't, I would say I wasn't too bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I never got expelled or anything like that, but I was, um, I think when I was in first school, the teachers used to say, oh, Nathaniel must keep his hands and feet to himself to my mum. <laughs> all I wanted to do was play fight. You know, I was just this, I was just a kid that just likes play fighting. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't, um, obviously back when I was a kid, there wasn't like iPhones and stuff like that for us to play with. But I was just always kicking a football, trying to do WWE, WWF moves, you know, trying to mess about with my mates doing like, you know, some Kung Fu technique that I've seen on Dragon Ball Z. And, um, you know, the teachers used to get get a bit annoyed about that because we wasn't allowed Mm. to play fight and, do all those sort of things so you know I'd say I was a good, a good kid but a little bit mischievous you know I like to I, I like to wind the teachers up and that sort of stuff but um yeah I think overall you know I, was, I think I'm a good kid and um you know I never got expelled or anything like that so you know I surely was doing something right <laughs> yeah that's good that's good and when when did you get into sort of this combat sports world am I right in saying you got into it rather late like the late sort of teens weren't it because mo- most kids that that mm-hmm. box were sort of hanging around the gyms like literally in their five six year sort of that five six years of age sort of period isn't it so when oh, it- so yeah with, with me um I started training when I was I think I was 16 might have been 15 just as I left school and um you know I'd done a little bit of kickboxing when I was about 11 years old but then it stopped because I was playing football um, and the, the times clashed, but um, it's a weird one with me. So, like, you know, a lot of people have a kind of story how they fell into MMA and, you know, it was by accident or whatever. With me, I literally just said, like, to my dad, I was like, well, I want to do a sport for a living. And I was looking, thinking, like, you know, there's no sports that you can do at the age of 16, really, and make a career out of it. You know, usually, if you're a footballer, you're probably being looked at signed by the time you're 16, 18 years old. You know, the same boxing, you know, yeah, I had no amateur career or anything like that. And at the time, I was watching the UFC. Um, I was a big fan of it anyway. You know, I always had the games. And I was looking at, um, you know, like the embedded countdown kind of things and yeah. seeing, like, Demetrius Johnson and Brad Pickett, who's now my coach. A lot of them didn't start till they were in their 20s. Um, and I literally just thought, right, if I start now, I can make this a career, you know, wow. make a living out of it. And I said to my dad, who was training at um jiu-jitsu gym at the time, I just said, right, Dad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a USC fighter, and he was like, yeah, all right, son, like right, whatever, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just went along with him. First day, was, I was like a duck to water, mate. You know, it was, uh, you know, I just fell in love with the sport instantly. I picked it up very well, and it's like, you know, being a child again. I'm, I'm play fighting for a living, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Paid. yeah, nice. And w- that's it. Like you said, you you was like a duck to water to to sort of the whole combat sport world then. But say if you wasn't that good, do you think you would have almost like forced yourself to to be involved in that? Like you said, you wanted to do something sports related. Do you think you would have forced yourself to put in that work, train and sort of get to a better level, even if you weren't naturally good at it going into it? 
No, because it's weird. I, uh, even before my first session, I was like, no, no, if I just keep doing it, I will yeah, you know, make yeah. a living out of it. I will be that good. You know, I just thought, thought to myself, right, I've got two arms, I've got two legs. I'm no different from anyone else. Um, and I was an athletic kid anyway, you know, so I thought to myself, like, if Demetrius Johnson, if Brad Pickett, if, you know, these guys can do it, I can do it. Um, so I never had a doubt about doing it. And at the time I was doing like labouring work building stuff which I hated but mm. you know I just kept saying to myself it's cool because I'm going to make a living out of this um so in a way I didn't ever have a plan b um yes. which now like you know I think <laughs> oh, shit like maybe I should have had a plan yeah, b yeah. because you know I could be sitting here just doing something I hate right and not having anything to kind of fall back on and you know lucky for me I just kept doing it you know if I lost my fight cool brush it off get back in the gym and with MMA you know it's a it's an easy sport in the sense where if you just keep winning it's inevitable that you're gonna get to the top you know you can't be ignored if you keep winning and you know I don't have to worry about I don't know like a scout coming in and relying on 10 other players if it was football you know it's just me train don't go out clubbing don't go out doing this you know just stay in the gym and do more than the other people are doing. And, you know, and now I'm in the UFC, I'm making a living out of it. And, you know, luckily I uh, stuck with it and, and never had a doubt. You mentioned there, obviously, sort of that that self-determination. You knew on a practical level, if you kept doing something, kept training, kept knocking at that door, eventually the door's going to open up. And, and, and like you said, you sort of said, looking back now, you almost, it was quite crazy that you didn't have a plan B. But for the kids listening, what, what, what do you think you said? Because my audience is mostly young people either interested in business or interested in becoming an independent of some sort, whether that's an athlete yeah. or whatever it may be. So what, yeah, what would you advise to them sort of, do you think you almost have to have that crazy self-determination to make it? I think so. You have to be consistent. Uh, I think, you know, because you're going to fail. I don't, I don't personally know anyone that's just smashed it from the get-go, you know, before I got to the UFC, I lost three fights. So every fight was a step back and you just have to get back on that horse and go again. Um, and I'd say it's like the same thing in business, you know, and I'm trying to run my own clothing company at the moment for something to fall back on, you know, that's it. I'm trying to invest in, um, you know, invest my money from fighting because I'm not stupid. The career eventually is going to end yeah. and I don't want to be just sitting there thinking right now, what am I going to do? I want stuff to fall back on. But yeah, you know, for any kind of kids, I'd say follow your passion. You know, don't just settle. Because I think today's age, you know, everyone's just getting a job to save money for a mortgage, to do, you know, what everyone tells them to do, get married, have kids, and then eventually die. Yeah. And if it's not what you want to do and, you know, you want to be the multimillionaire or you don't, you want to travel and be, I don't know, an Instagram influencer, there's no one there to stop you. You know, they don't teach you that at school. And I would just say stick with it because luckily for me, my parents were always um, uh, with me on the journey. You know, they, they helped me um, get to where I am today and they never had a doubt even really that I wasn't going to make it. But I had so many bosses at the time who I've been building work with say to me you know maybe you should stop with this little little fantasy dream that you've got and you know they've get a, get a real job and because even before I got to the USC I was earning mate seven grand a year let's say nothing do you know what I mean and I'm I think I was 23 I think I was 24 when I got to the USC so I didn't have a pot to piss in do you know what I mean I had a crap little rental Clio I didn't need anything I was living at my mum and dad's but you know, I just thought, right, stick with it. I was doing a bit of building work on the side and they were saying, look, you're like, they're sort of laughing at me a bit, like, Nathan, it's time you get a nice car, mate. Isn't it time you go and, you know, earn some proper money? And I just thought, uh, one day you'll be washing my car and, you know, just stick with it. Um, yeah. And that's what I say to people, you know, there's no, I guess there's no, uh, I think people put time limits on it and they say, you know, I've got to get this by this date and if I don't, you know, then I'm going to go and get a job. But, I think if you just stick with things, it's consistency. I think you'll eventually make it. And if you don't, I'm, as long as you're enjoying the process, like, you know, what's the problem? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I love that. And it's something I've been thinking of lately as well. And, and, and people that listen to this podcast on a regular basis will be laughing now because I always sort of chuck this in, in, in somehow. But... <laughs> 
what do you, what do you think of sort of the law of attraction manifestation stuff like that because you're you you was obviously visualizing whether you, mm-hmm. you knew it or not you was always you always had that in the back of your mind just watch wait and see i will mm-hmm. make it happen what what's your thoughts on that whole sort of world of manifestation so i've i've read the book um i can see yeah. sometimes that it's like you know people think if you just think in your head of a ferrari ferrari you know ferrari's mm-hmm. going to turn up i don't think that's quite ever going to happen mm-hmm. but i think it's it's what you attract because if you're constantly positive and for me as I say from the age of let's say 16 to 24 so that's eight years I didn't have a pot to piss in and I just kept persevering with it now if I'd given up at let's say 23 I would have been like ah, that kind of law of attraction stuff doesn't even work and whatnot but if you just keep at something I think it's inevitable that you're going to get there it's like your podcast when you first started you probably had what 10 people watching you know you probably uh, your mates tuning in and then you build up and it takes time to develop and who knows if you stick with it in five years time 10 i don't know what the age or what the time limit is but you're the next joe rogan and you're earning millions from a podcast like who knows and the only way you're going to be able to tell is if you stick with it and that's with the law of attraction because i kept thinking i'm gonna get to the ufc i'm gonna get to the ufc and I was just as good when I was 23 as I was when I was 24. But it takes that time to get them opportunities and to get to where you need to be. If you're thinking in your head, you know, ah, I'm not going to make it. And then if you don't believe in yourself, then who else will? You know, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know about sometimes I think people just think if you just think of what you want, you're going to get it. You have still got to work for it. Yeah, yeah. because there's many there's many days where you know my mates were going clubbing and they like, miss training tonight you know miss training tonight and you know I'd, i would have loved to i'd have loved to have gone on holiday with my mates and gone on a drinking weekend away whatever but you know my dream was more important um so yeah you have you have of course got to work for it but you've also got to be believing yourself and that's quite scary though isn't it like like you said, it, it, you don't know how far away you are from achieving it. Like if I was to stop this podcast today or if you was to stop training back, back in the day, you could have literally been a minute away from achieving everything or exactly. even a day away, mm-hmm. whatever it is, you could have literally been on that thing. So like you said, it's about sort of just keep going because you just never know what door is going to open next. The next door you open yeah. could be the one you've waited for. So if you quit, you, <laughs> you'd, you'd hate to quit exactly. and look back and think, oh, no, I was right there. Yeah, and I think um, it was a football player, I can't remember who said it, someone said something about, you know, I'd spent such and such years uh, practising to become an overnight success. Yeah. I know, as you say in Bolt, I think, you know, it was the amount of training he'd done, and obviously he'd done a what, like, it's like people say to me now, oh, Nate, you, you earn a bonus in your fight, like, what, so you fought for 10 minutes and you got paid, like, what, 80 grand? And I'm like, no, I didn't, I've, I've been doing this for the last 10 years, mate. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, not yeah. a 10 minute thing. So if all of a sudden in a few years time, your podcast is millions and millions of um, listeners, people will be like, oh, what you're, you're getting, you're earning how much for what? An hour podcast. Well, <laughs> it's not, it's the hours that you've put in over the years. You know, um, if you add it up, you know, not many people would be willing to spend the hours that you are now pursuing something that you want to do so you know i would always say to people make sure you're enjoying it because if you ain't enjoying it go and get a nine to five that's that's a huge point actually i'm glad you said that um because a lot of people force themselves into certain roles especially like i said i'm more in like the young entrepreneur world and because of social media um a lot of people think oh wow he looks like he's enjoying himself he's a trader therefore i must trade even though I, I'm not good with numbers. I don't have any money to invest. I'm going to force myself to be in that world just so mm. I can be the trader like that guy is who's got all the fake rented stuff. Um, so yeah. I think that's an important point to make, isn't it? Be 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 happy with what you do, enjoy it, and and ultimately be yourself. And I think you're testament to that. Like I said, you're the most one of the most humble people we've had on the podcast so far, um, yeah. and it shows. And I guess that's that sort of helps a lot. In, in all the connections you have yeah because I think as well what people do is they see they might see me now fighting and think oh he's got it easy do you know what I mean he does a, a two-hour session in the morning he does a two-hour session at night and then you know he fights a couple of times a year but I guarantee that I've put more blood sweat and tears into doing this 
than it would have been to just do a nine to five. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So even with your podcast now, when you make it and you're earning, I don't know, millions and millions of pounds doing your podcast that you love to do, people look and think, ah, oh, like he's got it easy. Well, I bet they're not willing to put the effort and time in that you are. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think people think it's an easy process and it's not. You know, I think the entrepreneur, I saw an entrepreneur thing when I was on um, Instagram. I think it said entrepreneurs, the only people that would tra uh, trade a nine to five for a five to nine. You know, yeah, yeah, basically yeah, yeah. saying that they're they're doing so much more than what the average person is doing because they want they want it. Um, so yeah, you know, I think a lot of people wouldn't actually be willing to put the work in to get to where you know a successful person is. Mm. I think they just think they get lucky. Um, so that's the whole thing about consistency. You know, you got to stick with it, otherwise, you know, I don't think you're ever gonna kind of make it in whatever you're doing. On that point there, and, and something you mentioned earlier about sacrificing the nights out and the, almost the social life, what, what have you had to sacrifice on, on top of sort of this, the, the social aspect of it in, in, to get to where you are now? And how important and necessary is a sacrifice to anything you do? So I would say that I sacrificed my uh, sort of late teens. So the 16 to 22, 23, you know, them years where, all your mates are going to Magaluf on holiday yeah. and they're all going to Ibiza and meeting up with girls and the, the, at the pubs and the bars and, you know, being 18 and being able to just drink and do what you want and having that freedom. I sacrificed all of that. You know, obviously I had my nights out. I went out with my friends yeah. occasionally, you know, I couldn't go out. I think when I was 18, my whole group of friends were out every single weekend for, I don't know, a couple of years. I would go out maybe once a month or once every two months. And when I'd go out, I think I'd take about 30 pounds or 40 pounds of cash because I had no more money to spend that night. And if I did spend more money, I wouldn't be able to then go um, and, and pay for my training. So wow. my friends would go out and they'd be, you know, buying all the bottles and buying girls drinks, splashing their cash, buying like the latest clothes. Yeah. And I would just be like, right, I've got 30 quid in my pocket. I won't tell no one. Once that's gone, I'm done. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I've got yeah. to get a, get a bus home. So I'd say I sacrificed those years, which I don't think is such a bad thing because, you know, drinking every weekend, it doesn't appeal to me anyway. Um, you know, luckily I've, I've been in long-term relationships. So, you know, that was always kind of good. I was never a, a single lad that was, you know, have to go out and meet the girls or something like that. So you know, that helped keep me kind of on the straight and narrow. But yeah, you know, I missed the sort of a lot of boys holidays that I would have liked to have gone on. But, you know, it wasn't worth um, risking my, my dream of being in the USC, you know, just to go away for weekends and weeks with my mates getting drunk. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I kind of missed those days where I think a lot of adults would have said with their best times of their life, where they're a bit wild and stuff, you know, I, I sacked all that off. Um, and just stayed in the gym yeah that, as you're talking I'm getting goosebumps because that's I'm, I'm 23 and that's sort of what I'm going for at the moment um and obviously mm -hmm. more more sort of in the past few years everyone was like let's go we're going I beef we're going here going mm -hmm. there. I'm like oh but if I do that then that's like a whole week of podcasts that I miss oh, out yeah. on and this and that and and the way I've always seen it like you said is that immediate gratification I can go out for a, for the for the week I can have a fun time enjoy it i'll probably be happy buzzing for a few weeks afterwards yeah. but like you said in the long term I, yeah I look at where i could have been so it's about that isn't it and i'm i'm glad you mentioned sort of <clears throat> sacrificing that younger period of your life um because have you heard of gary v gary vaynerchuk yeah 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 he, he's he talks about sort of jab 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 right hook so like that yeah. those younger years are where you you give 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 and you build yourself up, you build your character, build your portfolio, body of work, whatever it may be. And then you right hook at the very end when the time's right. Once you've built yourself yeah. up, you say, right, I've given enough. Let's ask for something. Let's get something back. Um, so I guess yeah. you're, you're in your right hook period of your life, I guess, now. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, as well, is like now, to me, I don't work. I do, but I mm -hmm. don't. You know, mm -hmm. to me, this is what I love to do. So if I had, if someone said to me now, right, Nate, we're going to give you a check for a, a billion pounds, you never have to work again in your, in your a day in your life. I would still do this. I would still go to the gym. I would still train. I'd still do jujitsu. I'd still 
go and box you know this is what I love to do so you know I think you need to make the sacrifices if it's something you want to do and get paid for um and the, the other sacrifice as well was being broke for eight years you know all my friends were buying nice cars and you know they would go and get tattoos and like they could just spend their money on whatever they wanted and I, I couldn't you know because I had no money my mom and dad said look you know we won't charge you any rent whilst you're kind of pursuing your dream so all you got to do is like fend for yourself so you know a couple of quid on a weekend for a Nando's a little bit of petrol money in me old Renault Clio and then I'm good to go um so yeah you know at the moment now it's paying off I'm glad I've done it and you know I'm still nowhere near where I want to be I've still got a big old journey in front of me um but luckily I enjoy it and now I'm getting paid to do it so yeah you know it's paying off we will get on to where, where you sort of are are at now and where you want to go in the future in just a moment. But the sort of last thing on, on, on this sort of topic, I think, but as you was talking there, I was thinking like now, obviously, because you've sacrificed, you've put in the work in the earlier stages, now you can do what you want. But I was just thinking, isn't it funny? Like the people that don't sacrifice are the ones now that like me and you, I've sort of, I've sacrificed my time. So I've got a bit of money saved up and now I've, I've got more of a flexible schedule than my friends who are in a nine to five. Even at this age, I can now afford both financially and time-wise to go and do what I want. Whereas now yeah. they're stuck because literally just those weekends partying, now they're stuck in a nine to five. And if I say, do you want to go do something on Wednesday? They're like, oh, let me ask the boss, see if I can get time off. Yeah. Now, me and you, like, I'm not saying I'm anything special, but I'm just saying in terms of the, the way it's panned out, now me and you can say, right, let's do something Wednesday. Yeah, sure, let's go. Like you don't really need to ask anyone. You've got that independence and freedom. So I guess that's what it's that's what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. For me, it's the freedom thing. You know, I would hate to be uh, tied down with a job and a boss. And like you just said, you know, uh, even my 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 missus. You know, she we went travelling and she had to ask her boss if we could go, and her boss said no. And eventually, she just quit anyway. Um, wow. but it's like yeah I can do what I want you know if I want to take the day off today tomorrow go on holiday I can do that I don't have to go and ask someone um, and you think we spend what 45 years of our life working so make sure it's something you want to do because that's the majority of your life um, and you know if someone said to me you know sack off five years eight years of your life when you're younger to be able to do what you want for a living Mate, I'll take that any day of the week, you know. Um, and now I think a lot of my friends, they're not they're not doing bad for themselves or anything like that. But I think a lot of them are sort of, I wish I saved up my money. You know, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. And, you know, they didn't put the work in. So, Well, we spoke about sort of going from that from that period where you were sacrificing to to start seeing success. But when, when you started going up the rankings, when you become professional and you worked your way up from the, the, the lower league sort of companies all the way up to what every, every combat fighter's dream is, the UFC, what was you thinking during that period? Like when you first got signed into the, to the first sort of corporation, what was running through your mind? What was the feelings? Did you think, wow, this is it, I've made it? Or did you sort of think, I'm at the first stepping stone. I've got a long way to go now to get to where I really want to be. I think I always felt that, you know, yeah. every fight, I was like, right, I need to beat this guy to go up the ladder. Yeah. Beat that guy, go up the ladder. But we, I don't, I didn't really celebrate that. I kind of thought, right, next fight, next fight. Yeah. So I'd always look at the next one. So that allowed me, I guess, to never be kind of complacent because, you know, instead of kind of, you know, I win Cage Warriors world title, for example. So I'm, world champion I wasn't on world champion money yeah. but I could have kind of said like you know this guy and party a bit flash my belt around and no you know I'm like I wanted to get to the UFC so you know I'd have a week off let's say after the fight call straight back in the gym you know and I've got a lot of teammates now who I've been with for years and they've not really done anything with it because they just do what everyone else does you know do a bit of training and then they might have a couple of weeks off have their fight and then they'll be they'll be gone for two months partying and yeah. you know whereas I just gym repeat you know train fight win repeat until I got to the UFC and then even when I'm in the UFC every fight now it's a big thing you know I need to get to the top 15 top 10 number one and then even when I'm number one I'll probably be looking at being pound for pound this so 
you know, I think everyone should set goals. Yeah. And once you've achieved that goal, on to the next one. You know, otherwise I think people can can get a bit complacent. Um yeah, that's kind of what I always always stuck with and kind of done, you know. Yeah, no, it's, it's so true. And I, I've seen it as well in the entrepreneur game. A lot of people start making good money for a few months. And then like, like you said, yes, I've made it. I've smashed it. Now yeah. I'm a successful business and blah, blah, blah. But much like in the in the sporting world, the business world is so brutal. Because if you mess up one week or something happens, i.e. coronavirus or whatever it may be, you have that one dip. And if you ain't sort of all hands on deck in the past, as soon as that wave comes, you 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 are done. You are completely finished. And once yeah. it's gone, you can't sort of work your way back up. So it's 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 important to sort of, like you said, be all hands on decks, at all, all hands on yeah. deck all the time, isn't it? Yeah. And again, it comes down to that enjoyment thing because I want to be back in the gym. Yeah. You know, what I mean, yeah. I'd have I'd have a coming up to my fight. Like, oh, I can't wait for a little break, and then after my fight, I have two days off, and I'm itching to go back training. You know, and that's why I say like, you know, pursue what you love and. You know, if you're doing your podcasts, you start earning millions of pounds, let's say you don't have to do it anymore, you probably will still do it because it's what you enjoy, it's what you want to do. And, you know, I think it's a Warren Buffett or whatever his name is, yeah. the, the, the multi-billionaire, you know, he still yeah. does it. And I think he, I saw something that he lives in like a very standard house. Yeah. He's a billionaire, but he's like, I'm just doing what I'm enjoying and cracking on, you know. Um, so that's the thing I think you need to enjoy what you do. That is the most kind of number one fundamental yeah. and then consistency you know no, that's pow- powerful and, and and sort of referring back to spirituality uh what, what we mentioned a while ago um it, this seems like destiny because didn't you meet your current coach brad pickett in, in a weird yeah. circumstance and and from an outsider outsider's perspective that does seem like a destiny because i always say i don't believe in coincidences but it, how, how did how did you two sort of start working together so originally I was a big fan of Brad. As I say, I was watching him before I even became, uh, sorry, before I even started training, before I even knew what I wanted to be, I was a fan of him. Wow. I saw him in a shopping centre once and was like, hey, Brad. And he just looked at me and was like, oh, you're right, like, you're right kid, whatever. And uh, then obviously got into training and, you know, we got introduced by a teammate who they both had the same manager. So we did a little bit of sparring together. And Brad said, look, do you want to come along with me to the, to the gym where I go to, we can do some training together. And I was like, hell yeah. Um, and then fortunately enough, Brad moved literally five minutes from my house. Wow. So now, you know, he's basically my neighbor. And at the time he was the number one guy in the UK at my weight. So, you know, what better person to have? And, and that's a big thing as well. You know, I think you've got to surround yourself with the right people. Yeah. You know, you, you're, you're only as good as um, the five people you surround yourself with. That's that, the quote I see. Yeah. And that's it. You know, I was like, right, I'm training with Brad Pickett, who's number one in the UK. I'm doing well with myself training with him. You know, I'm not getting smashed to pieces kind of thing. Cool. That's a little uh, reminder that you're doing the right stuff. You know, keep on doing it. And um, yeah, now he's like, he's a bit like a father figure, but he's like one of my best mates, you know, my coach kind of like a manager role as well but I do have a management team as well um and yeah you know that the rest is history we go on like a house on fire and you know um I wouldn't even say he's just a friend he's, he's family you know yeah, so yeah. That's crazy though, isn't it? Like how it all sort of works out. And it's something I always think that the stuff that's happened to me as well, you could never plan it. And I think that's an important message to perhaps get across. Like sometimes that it's not always a plan. You can't say, right, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to, then I'm going to go to the shop one day and then I'm going to meet this guy that I've like, I, I adore sort of thing in the fighting world. And then I'm going to like, he's going to move next door to me. Like some of the things you just can't plan for. Um, yeah. So, it's because I do see that a lot. People are, like, oh, what should I do next? What should I do next? It's like just do, yeah. just do you next, you know. I think you do have to put yourself in positions as well. So, like, yeah. you know, when my teammate at the time he said to me, "Look, I'm going to do a bit of sparring with Brad Pickett and Ashley Grimshaw. Do you want to come?" I could have said no, yeah. and then I, who knows where I would be now? But you know, I thought, fuck yeah, you know, Brad Pickett. Like, I'm going to get smashed by him. I'm an amateur, <laughs> but yeah, hell yeah, I'm going to go and join him. Um, went along and now look do you know what I mean and I think you know people need to make sure that they don't miss opportunities you know because it's not often they always come around so you know I was lucky enough to go along that day 
Brad said, come along with me. And yeah, here we are. Well, you never know. It could have been luck. It could have been destiny. Depends on how you look at it. But one of the things I wanted to mention as well, like before every fight, uh, for those that don't know, it's going to sound really weird, but you get slapped before every fight. Um, and, <laughs> and I wanted to bring that up because I've I, I recently been working with my business partner, um, Robert Icy. He's the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. Um, and he, he was teaching me about um, priming and triggers, anchors, stuff like that. F those little things that you do or the music that you listen to, to really get you into that prime state. Um, so for you, obviously, there's a slap in. Um, but is there anything else you do before a fight or during training that sort of switches your switches your brain back into that peak mindset? For me, a big, big one is music. You know, as you just said then, like before a fight, depending on what music I've got in my head, it depends on my mood. You know, if I've got something that's, you know, getting me pumped up, I'm ready to fight. If someone's given me, if I was listening to a podcast, 10 minutes before a fight, I'm probably like, mate, I just want to go home and chill out. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. want to fight. <laughs> so yeah, you know, music is a big one. And for me, as long as I don't sit still. So yes. if I sit down, I'm sort of like, oh, you know, start thinking about the fight. I'm thinking, you know, the family are there and who's going to watch me. And you're just thinking all kinds of things. And then, you know, get up, headphones in, I start marching around and just shadow boxing and whatever. And that, that you know, usually keeps me pumped up. Um, and then as I'm walking out to the fight, as you say, you know, a couple of slaps, get you all, uh, get the juices flowing. And yeah, that's how I would say that I get in that kind of fight mode. Yeah, that's it. And But you did say, like, obviously, I've, I've heard you say this before, that you do, as much as you like to be 100% in it when you are in it, you also like to have that cut off and sort of play PlayStation, play COD, whatever it is, just to sort of turn your mind off, isn't it? That's, that's Yeah. I so usually I have, so an hour to two hours before a fight, that's when I'm like, right, get in the zone. Mm -hmm. Because that's when I know, you. we usually, depends on how quick the fights before go. So there's times where you have to get warmed up a little bit earlier than you'd like to, because you don't know how fight the fight in front of you is going to finish. Um, but before that two hour, hour period, shoo, I've got to be switched off because otherwise it's draining. Yeah. You know, it's mentally draining if you're thinking about it 24 seven. So in my own, my own head, the rule is, I worry about the weight cut. Cool. The weight cut's done the day before. And then I worry about what I'm going to eat for dinner that night. Cool. Go to bed. And then when I wake up, the idea is to chill as much as I can yeah. until two hours before. Then it's right. Let's get fired up and you know, let's go. Because otherwise you just mentally just drain yourself. And I see so many fighters, you know, they turn up to the fight venue on fight day, let's say five hours before. And they look drained. They're like this, you know, just... <laughs> They don't want to be there. And yeah, yeah. For me, I want to enjoy it. You know, I don't want to overthink it. I want to be chilled because at the end of the day, this is what we do. This is what we love to do. So if I stress about it too much, you know, then I'm not going to enjoy it. So the idea is that, that two hours before, right, I'm going to get fired up. I'm going to get angry, if you like. And then after the fight, that's when the adrenaline jump dump comes in. And, you know, that's time to chill, chill again. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, you're right. It's that burnout, isn't it? And it's the same same with me. Like an hour or so before this podcast, I had my coffee, walking around my room, like psyching myself up, like sort of just thinking about everything, getting back in the zone, having that big plan of mine in the back of my head as well, uh, which really sort of keeps me firing. So whenever I feel a bit down, I think, hold on, what am I doing this for? Right, let's go. Let's, let's work towards that. Um, but like you said, two, three hours, <laughs> you should see me i'm like on my desk slumped over if you saw me you'd be like mate are you all right like <laughs> what's going on but in my head like yeah. you said i'm just sort of just sort of calling down ready to psych myself yeah. up. So i guess that's i guess it's like a job interview you know if you have a job interview in a week's time and you think about it every day and you start stressing about it when you come to your job interview you're probably going to just like not even know what to say yeah you know but i guess of course anyone's going to be nervous an hour before maybe two hours before but if you can try and chill before then, you know, it gives your mind a bit of a rest. And then, you know, hour before your interview, call, cool, let's get pumped up for it and, you know, try and think what we're going to say. Um, but, yeah, I guess everyone's different. You know, some people, maybe they do other ways. But, you know, that's how I, I find that I, I get on well with it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's sort of like being selective, isn't it? And, and that's one thing I actually wanted to, to point out for you. Like, in terms of your fighting style as well, like every fight I've watched of yours... 
it's like you're so precise and selective like is, is that something you consciously yeah. think about or is, is that just your style yes yeah. yeah so my dad who's also my coach I should have said yeah, that yeah, yeah. um he's, he's also my striking coach as well and he always says be like a sniper you know pick mm. your shots make them count because you can be the most powerful guy in the world but if you don't land you know it's no point it's not going to do anything so you know I try and be as you said selective with my shots and I try and just make sure they land you know I want every single bit of energy that I waste to do damage in the fight because if I throw 100 shots and miss 90 of them well that's 90 shots that I've wasted energy so yeah, yeah. you know I try and make sure that every shot I throw hits the target and you know that's that's the plan anyway yeah. and and for, in terms of sort of um fighting your precise and, and like we said just before that as well in in terms of sort of prioritizing what you're doing and having that hour where you're like fully in the zone and then those three hours when you're not there's something that i'd like to you, you might know about it but there's something that i think everyone listening should know about um i believe it's pronounced the pomodoro technique um, and it's basically it's basically what we just said. So you spend, say, 25 minutes working full on, no distractions. Then you have a five, 10 minute rest. Then you go in for another 25 minutes and another. It's sort of just breaking that down, chunking it down, um, especially for people. I think I've got it, um, especially with people with ADHD, um, <laughs> forcing yourself to sit down and and be in that zone is is powerful because otherwise you think, you know, I, I do. I sit down all today. I've got all day to do work. Go on my phone. I do a bit of this, do a bit of that, and and like you said, it just doesn't work, does it? Yeah, and I think you only have a certain. I don't know like what the the science is behind it, but I'm sure you only have a certain like attention span. Because even me, you know, if I like reading books, but I'd say half an hour any longer, I'm not even taking it in. I'm just reading the words. Mm -hmm. So I try to, you know, break my reading down. So I might do 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night or however, you know. Um, but I guess it's a similar thing. You know, I think uh, human nature, I think we get distracted quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's hard to stay in that zone for a certain amount of time before you're thinking about other stuff. But yeah, you know, again, I don't know the whole kind of science behind it. I might be completely yeah. wrong. But yeah, no. Yeah, that's no, even for me, sometimes on these podcasts, like, I've been listening to what the person's saying. And once they finish speaking, I think, oh, my God, I've, I've lost it. Yeah, I've lost it because I, I, I'm thinking of things to say when you're talking. Yeah. Like, sometimes I think, oh, no, what, about, what what has he just said? I know you said something, but I can't remember what. Um, and then if I'm sitting there waiting for your reply and you're like. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, but the last few things then, because I know you I, I know you're probably very busy, so I appreciate your time. Um, the la last few things. Um, how important is it to, and fighting is the perfect example of this because you have that team around you, how important is it to have those what I call accountability buddies, accountability partners, whatever you want to call it, the people that keep you on track, tell you when to speed up, slow down, or tell you when to stop? Mate, I think super, super, super important, you know. As I said, like, when on my journey, my parents were very supportive, yeah. you know, and they would encourage me to do what I want. You know, my mum's like, as long as you're happy. And that's me getting in a cage to fight someone. My mum's like, yeah, if it makes you happy, you know, do it. Yeah. But my parents could have turned around and said, no, 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 you know, you, you're not going to do that. You're going to go to college and university. And, you know, if, if I had someone keep telling me every day, don't do it, it's stupid, don't do it, you know, then I probably would have, you know, drifted off. Yeah. But luckily, you know, I had the right people behind me, like pursuing, uh, like spurring me on. And it's the same thing like now, if my teammates were, let's just say, all rubbish, none of them took it seriously, yeah. then I would probably end up being like that. You know, luckily I'm surrounding myself with professionals. You know, my whole team are very professional. My coaches is, is, are the best sort of coaches I think that I can get, especially in the UK anyway. And I think that says a lot for your performance. Um, you know, again, it's like the same. Look at the five people you surround yourself with. And that's probably what you're going to turn out to be like. Um, so, yeah, I'm still friends with all my friends from, from the day one. You know, I don't think I would just get rid of them to go and start hanging around with other people. Um, but it's important in your line of work. You know, if you want to be the best uh, footballer in the world, cool. You need to surround yourself with the best football team that you could be with, you know, the best coaches. And I guess it's the same in business. You know, if you surround yourself with successful business entrepreneurs then you know they'll probably give you good advice and spur you on well if you hang around with a lot of entrepreneurs that have failed 
they'll probably be telling you, no, don't, don't do it, don't pursue it, go and get nine to five. And you know, that's probably what you'll end up listening yeah. to. Yeah, no, I've ha- I've had that before as well. I've st- I've I've sort of stopped taking advice from people now because I- I've realised a lot of people are reflecting their own insecurities, like you said. Like mum, mum I hate to say it, my mum, for example, she'd be like, "I oh, don't do that. You- that this will probably end up happening, or that won't work." It's like, how how would you know? You've never you've never done it yourself. Yeah. So w- w- where are you sort of getting this from? So yeah, it's definitely important to sort of select who you're listening to. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about to to sort of wrap this up. I've seen your footage today on your Instagram. It looks like you're preparing for something. Will will we see you fighting soon? It looks like you're back in action. Obviously, your last fight was a, a controversial loss. Um, are you coming back sometime soon? Um, can you reveal anything just yet? Because you look. I can't like reveal <laughs> anything, but we have something in the in the in the works. And yeah. yes, I'll be I'll be back soon. Yeah. Um, I've just come back from a hand injury, so yeah. I'm just getting back into proper training now. Um, but yeah, you know, within the next few months, we should, you should see me back in there. So I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, and we saw, saw you today, you spoke about the hand injury. We, I saw you today, um, frying those elbows. Um, you was with Christian Knowles, weren't you? And obviously in yeah. another podcast, you mentioned about those Jonathan Haggerty elbows. Um, shout mm-hmm. out John. Um, yeah, it looks like you're really sort of knuckling down on that, on that one particular skill set, and it seems to be paying off. Yeah, I think as well, every, um, you know, injury is a time to, you know, focus on something else. And yeah. that's the thing, you know, after that last fight, I thought, man, there was a lot of in-the-pocket exchanges. And I thought, if I could work on my elbows, make them a bit more, more natural, you know, I'd have took them to pieces. And that's what I've done since my last fight. Obviously, not being able to punch with the right hand means, you know, I can jab, <laughs> kick and throw elbows and knees. So, you know, I've been focusing on that a lot since my last fight. And... I always look to improve, even if, you know, I'm, I'm in a bit of a setback. So, you know, it's what you make of it, isn't it? You know, I can't train properly with my hands. Cool, let's focus on something else. Um, I'm, I guess I'm just obsessed with getting better, you know. Even now, when I read, like, I don't really like reading, but I like learning. Yeah. Because I always think of it as like, you know, you're upgrading the software. Um, yeah. And that's the same with my, my athleticism and, and fighting. You know, I want to get better. I don't want to think, you know, I've got a hand injury, cool, let's sit out until it's better. You know, let's let's yeah. focus on something. And, that's it. you know, if it's elbows, cool, we're going to get good at elbows. Yeah, that, that's such a good lesson, though, for everyone listening, no matter what area you're in, even if it's like business. Because like you said, if, if one thing's not working or you can't do one thing at the moment, it's just yeah. a perfect opportunity to then focus on something else. So it's never, you're never down and out fully. There's always something you can work on. Yeah, there's always something you can do. Yeah. Always something. That's it. So what is next for you then? You obviously mentioned that you, you could be sort of close to your next fight. Um, have you got your eyes on anyone? Um, and in terms of your career, what sort of your, your plan to sort of bounce back from that, like I said, a co- controversial loss last time? So there's no one in particular that I'm calling out. I don't know what I'm calling out. It's no one ever gets, <laughs> that actually accepts your fight. So, you know, I'm bored of that. So whoever the UFC give me, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take and I'm going to plan to dismantle them very quickly and you know get paid for it so at the moment my plan is get in a fit fit state you know get sharp fight win the money i make through winning invest it or do something with it because it's very easy to just you know go off and spend loads of money and buy and stuff and you know that's it just keep keep winning mate get into that top 10 become ufc champ then pound for pound number one yes let's and then uh, yeah, I don't know what when I'm retired. You know, hopefully my clothing business will go skyrocket through the roof and definitely. I'll be the next uh, Nike or Adidas or something. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Uh, definitely, mate. It's, look, it's looking good, definitely. Um, I think you've got the whole nation behind you, if not more than that. Um, definitely looking good for you. Um, and like I said, I've been a massive fan just just simply of your personality, your character as well. So that definitely that definitely says, says a lot. Um, final question for you before I let you go. Mm-hmm. we sort of touched upon it sort of briefly but what do you want your legacy to be if if you want a legacy at all hey the main thing honestly is just being remembered as a nice guy yes. <laughs> and being a good person you know that honestly to me i think would mean more than any sort of achievement in like you know the ufc i want people to you know if, to remember me as a nice guy 
I want to make my parents proud, my friends proud, the whole nation proud, you know, um, that to me is more special than just saying, you know, I've got this amount of money or something, you know, I, I, I would like to be a multi, multi, multi millionaire. Yeah. Because I want to go and help the world. You know, I want to go and say, oh, Naif was known for, you know, building a hundred dog shelter homes and, yeah. you know, going, I don't know, just doing good in the world, man. And, you know, money can, can help you do that. Um, so, yeah, you know, that for me is probably the most important thing that I would like to achieve and be remembered for. So I'm going to use fighting to make that money and then use that money to do good in the world. And, you know, hopefully uh, as well, like, you know, I try not to ever put on a, a character. A lot of people change their personalities in fighting. You know, they play the bad guy or whatever to, you know, build up their publicity. And I, I don't, you know, the, the rule is I'm going to be exactly who I am. And hopefully the people like it. If they don't, you know, I'll be upset because that generally is me. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm uh, at the moment, I feel like I've got good support behind me. That means the world to me. And, you know, hopefully I can keep on, you know, doing more and putting on a show for everyone. No, that's perfect. I love that. And I lo love the idea of your sort of using your life dream as just a stepping stone to get to the to ne to the next step of giving back i think that's powerful mate um yeah mate it's, it's one of those things that i think when i'm hopefully very old on my deathbed yeah. with all my family around me i'd like for someone to come up to me and say what good did you do in the world and for me to have a long list of stuff you know i think that would make me feel very good um i don't want to just you know be another guy that just done nothing with his life and that's it you know I just want to do something good and you know be remembered for just being a good nice person I love that and on that note thank you so much mate it's been an absolute pleasure I'm sure everyone mate, listening has welcome. got all the value that I've got as well um the floor is now yours if you've got a final message or if you just want to tell everyone where to find out more about yourself um please do so now just thanks for having me yourself. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's at the prospect MMA. I delete Twitter because it's too toxic for me. Um, so yeah, you know, hopefully if no one has seen my fights, check them out. I'd like to hope that you've been entertained. Um, and yeah, mate, thanks for having me. You know, it's always a pleasure coming on these things. So I've enjoyed it. If only they knew the hub for young business minds.